Welcome to Conference Highlights, recorded in front of a live audience at an evidence-based perioperative medicine, that's EPPOM Conference. EPPOM are world leaders in perioperative education, so why not join us at our next meeting with a special discount for Top Med Talk subscribers. Look us up on www.ebpom, that's E-B-P-O-M, dot com. Top Med Talk. Next up, we have uh, Dr. Attila Kett. Uh, Dr. Kett is the um, Chair of Anesthesiology at St. Peter's Healthcare System in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And I believe uh, we heard your surgical partner speak yesterday. It was very good. And he's going to talk about what us women want. <laughs> Please don't ask me any of the Slido questions there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no Ty, you know who I am. Uh, so, I would like to highlight the most important points of an enhanced recovery program uh, after cesarean sections. For those of you who are interested more in the details, in the nuts and bolts, we have a breakout session tomorrow, a workshop, where we are going to go down more into the granular details and we'll discuss the nuts and bolts. We have a real treat for you over there. Dr. Zakowski is here, who is the president of the Obstetric Anesthesia and Perinatology, and he will uh, talk about uh, this topic as well. So, uh, I am from New Jersey, from St. Peter's University Hospital. Our institution is one of the largest perinatal centers on the East Coast, so it kind of really made sense for us to look obstetrics. This is the area where we could make a real impact, and also, when we started this over three years ago, there was no BRAS program in the country. So that was kind of like a challenge, but at the same time, the really interesting part of this as well. Uh, luckily, like uh, many good things coming from the UK, probably some here would say most good things are coming from the UK, at least in uh, the area of uh, uh, perioperative medicine, they already had a couple of programs running. And uh, this publication came out in 2015, and even if you just read the title, it's shocking. They're not talking about ERAS, they're talking about next day discharge after C-section, so one day um, in the hospital. And uh, 2015, 25% of their patients went home on day one, now it's over 50%. Uh, next question, however, can we do it here? Unfortunately, in this country, there are some bad memories. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, there, at the heyday of uh, HMOs, they tried it. They tried it, but without the science, without perioperative medicine, without ERAS. They, it was a pure financial incentive. So Kaiser started to send home women six, 12 hours after delivery, literally kicking them out of the hospital. And of course, media picked up on this. They called it uh, uh, drive-through deliveries. And uh, pretty quickly, they enacted the uh, uh, Mothers and Babies Protection Act, which is also known as the market law. And this uh, actually protects really women because uh, insurance companies cannot deny payment for 48 hours after vaginal delivery or uh, 96 hours after C-sections. However, many thought that uh, that means patients has to stay in the hospital that long. That's not the case. So before we went further, we did a, a, a qualitative study to see whether our patients uh, culturally different. Do they really want to stay in the hospital, what's their priorities? And as you see, keeping hospitals stay short, it's very, very important for them. Uh, there are three core pillars for uh, uh, ERAS in OB as well. First one, standardized care, the protocols, we talked about it yesterday. We'll talk about it in details tomorrow. Uh, it's the easier part. There is a unique opportunity with patient autonomy and um, uh, communication here. These patients are literally all millennial women. So they grew up with the internet, they grew up with their cell phones. It's literally an extension, almost like a body part for them. So we figured that 
Well, can we use this both for education, uh, measuring compliance? We talked about it yesterday, how important it is to uh, measure compliance, keep it at uh, a certain level, and also remote monitoring. If they go home earlier, how can we keep an eye on them? How can we make sure that uh, they are doing well, they are not in pain, they don't have any complications? And if they do, how can we make that information actionable? How can we actually act on it? So we introduced a, a program. We, this is kind of, I could call it, our app 2.0 because it's the second version already. And uh, it really, really helps us to achieve, again, tracking patient compliance, progress, of course, education and uh, engagement, and eventually improve outcomes and remote monitoring. Uh, when we introduced the program three years ago, the opioid epidemic wasn't such a central topic. Now it is, so there are certainly a lot of things what we added to this program, and uh, one of them is uh, uh, individualized narcotic prescribing. Liz touched down on this a little bit yesterday, so the point here, with our pain management program, we were able to uh, reduce narcotic use from 60 MMEs to about 15 MMEs, so fourfold, but then came the next question, what do you do with that information? Great, you, you use less narcotics in the hospital, but how do you make it actionable? Do they go home with the same amount, less? What do we do? So we have a shared decision-making tool, and based on the last 24-hour narcotic use in the hospital, we recommend uh, what the patient should go, but the ultimate decision is kind of with the patient, and afterwards, with that, we're able to track how many narcotic pills they get home, they enter, how many they take. If they're about to run out, we're able to, to call them and be able to supplement that prescription. And if they are actually having a lot of leftovers, send out messages how to dispose it properly so it doesn't end up on the medicine cabinet shelf and get ready for diversion. So after these two points, the, the probably we talked about it yesterday a lot, uh, change. This is the most difficult and, uh, and the trickiest part. Uh, when we were uh, planning this program, both Liz and myself, we were in business school. And uh, when we were in business school, we learned about change management programs and we learned about the eight-step Carter approach. Lucky for us, uh, in 2014-15, Cotter modified his original eight-step approach. So he published a book called Accelerate, and in this book, uh, there are certainly, uh, it's a response to all those changes which happened since uh, the original uh, uh, leading change was published. Nowadays, everybody wants change much quicker, much, much quicker. Don't have that kind of patience. And also, uh, everybody wants multiple change processes at the same time. So one of the biggest change here is, if you look at number four, enlist a volunteer army. So get as many people in your organization involved as possible. Have a lot of talks, have a lot of communication. And uh, that's exactly what we did. And uh, we created this kind of like uh, second network uh, right next to the uh, uh, traditional hierarchy. You know, it looks complicated, but really what it is, a lot of people got involved. Some people from the traditional hierarchy. So we had our CNO very involved, our director of uh, women's and children's, but a lot of frontline nurses, our um, secretary from labor and delivery, a lot of, lot of people, and what I believe very, very important, these were people who wanted to do it, not had to do it. They were a lot of people, not just a few, few appointees, and they were there with head and heart, not just with their head. So that really, really helped us in this change uh, process. Again, it was not really like management, the top-down approach. It was really kind of mobilized leadership. So with ending with this... Uh, Again, communication is super important. 
communicate with your patients. If you have the luxury, you can use technology uh, to do that. Communicate with colleagues all the time. Enthusiastic staff, that's the volunteer army. Very, very important. And you can't let up. You have to maintain the momentum. Even after three years now, we have a very functional, very good uh, OBRAS program. Probably well over 500 patients went through this uh, program already. But we will still have to collect data, continuously evaluate the data, and make sure that the program is running well. That's all I have. Thank you so much. Greg Majerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out topmedtalk.com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.